Hi, Val here, and this is my podcast, The Kalahari Diaries. I live in one of Africa's most remote wilderness areas. Nature and wildlife is my biggest passion. I hand-dressed Serga the lioness and walked the Kalahari to join her on her hunts. My work is on tourism and nature conservation. For fun, but also for wildlife monitoring, I fly anything that gets me into the air. I live in an old caravan. The next supermarket is a two and a half hour drive away on sandy and bumpy roads. There is no cell reception anywhere nearby, and the only comms is an extremely slow, extremely expensive satellite internet connection. I am Valentin Grüne, and this is my podcast, The Kalahari Diaries. If any of you are interested in supporting us further and becoming part of this journey, we have recently started a Patreon page where you can support us financially by signing up for a monthly donation of your choosing. You can get access to exclusive footage and updates, everything behind the scenes, what's going on here. We're trying to keep that page very informative and entertaining for everybody who just wants to feel a little bit like they share the life that we have here and at the same time become part of hopefully what will become a bit of a success in conservation in this area. You can find the link to this page under Patreon dot com slash serga and it'll also be underneath the podcast in the description thanks very much for listening okay here we go again with the kalahari diaries and this is episode number four of our podcast over the last 60 to 70 years africa has lost about 90 percent of its wild lion population and that's a fact that's fairly widely portrayed in the worldwide media on, on television and the newspapers and things like that so it's not unknown and especially people that are here maybe because they love African wildlife and lions and stuff like that, probably know about this fact. I think what many people don't know is the reason why, and that is something I'd like to discuss in this episode of the podcast. When I first moved to Africa, my idea was to save lions no matter what, and I always had this picture in mind that, you know, we'd be traveling around with helicopters and vets on board and be saving lions before they get shot in a farm and that we'd all bring them into a big facility where we can take care of them and from there we're going to get them ready if the injured will look after them, if the orphaned will look after them and all of these animals need to be released back into the wild and I was convinced that we can make this work, that the story will work, that we'll get the funding and that we can we can do this big thing of, of saving all of these animals to make things better and to create more lions in Africa and to stop them from be, being lost forever and none of my intention has changed at all i love lions and i want to protect them and i want to do the best for them but if i think back of this idea initially i have to unfortunately admit today that it makes absolutely no sense now today is 12 years later i have been here for a while and i have although i never actually took a a proper degree in any conservation stuff i believe i have 12 years of experience in this field working in the bush, working with lions, and I have a very keen interest in nature conservation and scientific sort of subjects around it. So I don't think I've read an actual novel or anything for the last 12 years, but I've read a hell of a lot of scientific articles, papers, anything that is somehow publicly available that I could find on the internet that was given to me by many friends. I've worked together with a lot of researchers in this region, and I've developed a certain understanding of the Kalahari ecosystem. And that is something I would like to share today. And I hope that we come out sort of at a point where everyone can understand what happened in the Kalahari, why it happened, and, you know, maybe understand my approach to what can be done about it. But I'm also keen to hear your ideas. Maybe people come up with amazing stuff that I haven't thought of, because if we would know what could be done about it, obviously, we wouldn't have this scenario that we're looking at today. Before we go anywhere else with this, it's very important that everybody has a bit of a simple understanding of how an ecosystem actually works. And for that, we don't need to know much about the lion. The lion sits right on top of the food chain. And if we imagine that food pyramid, we have that very, very wide bottom, which definitely doesn't have a lion in it. It's got all kinds of things in it, vegetation, grasses, rocks surrounding that we'd have a certain climate rainfall all of these things which create a basis that can then grow this vegetation now that vegetation starts feeding all kinds of small things we have birds that are all over in between different species we have all the insect and all kinds of things that 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 nobody really cares about too much if we're talking about endangered species and things like that and 
that whole thing creates this basis for our larger mammals to live off. Some of them live off the smaller insects and some of them live off the vegetation. Some of them live a bit of a mixture of everything. And mostly what forms the first basis is the herbivores, a fairly wide base of herbivores who are eating grasses and leaves and things like that. On top of that, we have then our carnivores. That's where our lion population and wolves and bears and all kinds of things fit in. And some of them, like the bear, are actually a quite a bit of a mixed feeder. They'll eat all kinds of stuff. And on top of that, we'll have our scavengers and vultures and things like that. And that whole system needs to work. Now, the lions are relatively far on the top of that. And all of the underneath things are very important for that lion to live wild. And I think that's the main point uh, I would like to make here. I, I don't believe we need to save lions so that they can sit in an enclosure and be looked at, even though we somehow managed to get meat to feed them. What we would like to preserve is that actual ecosystem that those animals can live free in that world where they naturally are supposed to exist and for that to work we need to look at the whole picture now in future episodes we'll talk a lot more about certain details of this food pyramid about vegetation quite interesting stuff actually but this one would get way too long if we go into too much detail but one thing that needs to be very clear is this idea of a certain area let's say Botswana. Now, some of Botswana's space is already occupied with cities, villages, people, all kinds of things. And generally, where we settle, we don't exactly live with the wildlife right next door to us. We create a scenario where that wildlife doesn't exist, and we use the surrounding areas for agricultural purposes, mining, and all kinds of things. Now, then we have our wildlife areas. Botswana has some of the largest wildlife areas left on our earth today. And most of that is part of the Kalahari with the Okavango Delta right in the north of the country. It's important that we understand there is a limited amount of space. Now, if we take certain countries in Europe where we have a fairly high population of people and a very intense utilization of our surrounding areas, it's almost impossible to say we could bring back huge populations of wild animals because we simply don't have that space. Botswana still has a lot of space left. And a lot of that is designated wildlife areas. Between the Central Kalahari Game Reserve and the Kalahari Transfrontier Park, the Maharikari and Ngaipan National Parks, the Romoremi Game Reserve and Chobi National Park, we have a lot of protected areas that are full of wildlife. And that's still a limited amount of space. Now, that space has a certain capacity to carry certain numbers of animals. And that capacity does not change really over a longer period of time. It changes from year to year depending on how much rain falls. But overall, the average means in the Kalahari, in a certain ecosystem, we only have this much space for so many animals to live in. Now, if we put more animals into that area, they will eat too much of the vegetation, if we're talking about the herbivores. And then that vegetation starts disappearing. If all those animals love a certain kind of grass, now these animals are going to go in and eat all of those grasses. Those grasses might not even grow big enough to even produce a seed. And in a few years' time, there won't be a single one of those grasses left. What's actually becoming extinct first could be a grass species, if we have too many animals eating there. Now, if the grass species disappears and certain animals might be dependent on eating those kind of grasses, obviously those animals will start dying. Now... After that, our predators will start to disappear because now there's less food for them and we can have less predators that fit into this area. So it's important that we keep the right balance. Now, if we don't have the right balance, those grasses might grow way too much. They become so thick, then they fall over. They're kind of dead because they don't live again the next year. Some grasses do. They are perennial and annual grasses, but we'll, like I said, go into that in more detail in future episodes of the podcast. But... The bottom line is, imagine all these grasses growing and nothing utilizes them. Imagine that in your own garden at home. Imagine you never cut the lawn. That grass falls over and it will cover the ground. Imagine, I remember as kids, we used to pitch a tent somewhere outside in the garden. And every time dad used to tell us, no, we have to take the tent down again when we finished with it. And of course, the children, you know, it's, it's exciting and fun and everything. And then... You know, you forget about the tent afterwards and you're too lazy to take it down and your mind's too busy already on the next project. And a week later, dad's grumpy and he makes you take the tent down and there's like a bare patch of soil underneath. It was beautiful green grass before. The grass that would 
die and lie around would create a very similar sort of scenario. It actually covers the ground, the new grasses, even if there's a lot of seed underneath, the seeds won't get any sun and they won't grow. It will kill a lot of vegetation. So it has to be balanced. Now, naturally, there are things that are not actually animals, but something like fire that can replace these things. But we all don't want too many bushfires and there needs to be a balance in certain ecosystems. Fires are something that's very important and good for the ecosystem, but not too much. The same way we want, we want not too much grazing or not too little grazing from our herbivores. And the same way we want not too many predators predating on these herbivores because they can affect, you know, the bottom of the food chain with that. So that whole balance needs to be understood. And what's important to understand is that a certain size area can only sustainably be home to a certain amount of wild animals. The more that we increase into habitat that's there for wildlife, the less of that space will be there, the less of these animals will be there. At the same time, we have many areas like the Kalahari here in Botswana as a perfect example, where we have a lot of space. And today we're actually sitting with a problem where that space still exists, but a lot of the animals have disappeared. And that's something that we should look into a little bit more detailed. To understand the whole ecosystem of the Kalahari and the animal numbers that it could carry, we need to understand that the Kalahari is a semi-desert ecosystem. It's classified a desert because it does not have any permanent surface water. Other than that, the Kalahari is actually an area that is fairly full of vegetation. It's not just a big sand pit. It actually has a relatively dense grass cover, lots of shrubs, lots of trees. It varies in different areas because it's a huge area. Most of Botswana is part of the Kalahari. But overall, it's a very, very fertile ecosystem with enough rainfall to grow a lot of vegetation. Now, from what we just said before, that means there is a lot of food available for many, many herbivores. That means there's a lot of space available for many, many predators to exist. The thing is, though, that what we said before, not having permanent surface water for many animals would mean, although there's a lot of food around, you can't stay there if there's nothing to drink. I think we all understand that. We all need to drink water. The same story goes for most animals. We have some species that are very adapted to living in the desert that don't actually need to drink actual water. Doesn't mean they don't get water, but most animals and specifically the ones that make up large numbers usually need to drink fairly regularly. And that is something that the Kalahari in a way used to provide. If we're looking at the north of Botswana, the Okavango Delta, the world's largest inland delta, it actually fills from areas that are not in Botswana, it fills north of us in Angola, where some areas receive a hell of a lot more rainfall than we do. And those areas, the water starts running down the mountains and the slopes, it fills up rivers, and those rivers fill up during the rainy season, which happens at the same time as our rainy season, from about November, December, for about six months, it can rain. Now, we might only receive in our area 200, 250 millimeters, some years even only 100 millimeters of rain. Areas north of us can receive many, many times that amount of rain. And that is where the water for the Okavango Delta comes from. Even though the region there in the north of Botswana only receives 600 millimeters, 700 millimeters in a good year, actually, they don't get enough rain to fill up something like the Okavango Delta. And there's something extremely unique that happens in this ecosystem. And that is so important to understand so that we can later on understand what, what really happened here in the recent past. So when that water from Angola starts coming, it takes a hell of a long time until it arrives in Botswana because it first has to fill these rivers. These rivers slowly flow. And obviously that starts happening when the rains are starting. Now, by the time that water arrives in Botswana and the delta, where it just spreads out into this big flat northern end of the Kalahari. Now, by the time the water arrives there, Botswana is actually just entering the dry part of its dry season. That means previously, Botswana hopefully had rain everywhere, all over the country. And some pans, sort of like seasonal lake areas, actually fill up all over the Kalahari, little bits and pieces. And it's green, so the vegetation has water in it. And animals have a hell of a paradise that is massive to explore. Now, our dry season starts approaching. And 
all of a sudden, all these little water holes are drying up. The vegetation's getting dry. The temperatures are getting cold. Some of the frost completely dries out the vegetation and makes it, you know, brown and, and horrible to eat. And a lot of these animals that are requiring a lot of moisture to live, they're all of a sudden really struggling. But what's happening in the north of our country at the same time is that the Okavango Delta starts flooding. So that small delta or small, it's still massive in size, but relative to that, it's now smaller. It starts to flood and it starts to spread out and it starts to actually send a couple of rivers you know, out on its last longest arms that are reaching areas, one called Lake Ngami, which is quite a bit south of the actual Okavango Delta, and another one, Lake Kao, which is part of the sort of Mahari Pants system near Rakops, which is also a few hundred kilometers sort of away from the Okavango Delta. Now, those areas are getting flooded and pumped with water in the dry season. As I'm doing this podcast, that has just happened. Areas that actually dried up for many, many months now, while we had our rainy season, they have just started filling and beautiful, massive amounts of water are pumping into these spaces. An animal needs to always have water available and food. And that is the big key here to this issue. If those animals say, okay, I always want water and food, I'm just going to stay in the Okavango Delta. There are many species that do that. Waterbuck, bushbuck, sable antelope, roan antelope, there are many, many more. They stick around in the Okavango Delta region and they never go anywhere else. That means, though, they are fairly limited in space because if we look at the whole of the Kalahari compared to the Okavango Delta region, the whole of the Kalahari is way, way bigger. On top of that, we need to consider that most of this Okavango Delta is actually underwater and not all of these animals are hippos. And even a hippo eats outside. It just sits in the water not to get sunburned. It goes outside at night mostly to graze. So those animals need food. And there are a lot of big animals like the hippos, like the elephants. Then there are the bushbuck and the sable antelope and the roan antelope and the sitatunga antelope and all kinds of things that are now competing for all the vegetation that is there nearby the water. And that is hard competition. If we would now imagine something like a migration of wildebeest who would all of a sudden stand right there, there would be no food left within a few days because hundreds of thousands of animals would come in there. All of the animals that now sit there would basically have to die even though they can drink water, but the vegetation would disappear. And maybe that doesn't happen in one year, but it would happen slowly. And in bad years, those things do happen. Bad droughts kill a lot of animals, scavengers and stuff do better than... But that's an up and down that naturally happens. Now, given this whole scenario, what Botswana used to have, and we're only talking 60, 70 years ago, there was a wildebeest migration here and zebra migration that was potentially equal or even bigger in size to the one that's still happening today in Tanzania in the Serengeti Masamara ecosystem. And whoever hasn't heard about that yet, it's absolutely worth looking it up. There's fantastic movies about it. It's one of these last big phenomena that our wild world has to offer today. And Botswana had that not very long ago. I was not aware of that at all when I moved here, but today I understand how it works. And what these animals did is that when the rains start, these big herds would move into the Kalahari because wherever they were before, they were limited to a certain area and the food was most likely getting pretty scarce for these animals. So as the rains come, the rest of this big area starts having green grasses. It starts having water puddles all over the place. Some are fairly big. They actually are like little lakes. And some of them can even last the whole year after a good rainy season. But then some years they do dry up. And obviously, as everything gets dry, those animals start moving and moving and moving further to where the water remains. And luckily, at that same time, the Okavango Delta gets bigger and bigger. And areas that were not occupied by all these animals that live around permanent water, because they didn't have any water, those areas would have grass left. And now they're getting pumped with water. And our wild animals start moving into these spaces. And they can spend the dry months in beautiful river areas where rivers have just arrived and just started pumping. So the vegetation has not been ruined yet because no animals would have been there before, at least not in that amount. And that way Botswana could be host to a population of animals that was massive and used to migrate through these areas. And it's absolutely stunning to listen to some of our old farmers here who have actually experienced all of this. There are very, very little proper scientific records of this big migration happening. But 
if you talk to farmers who have walked through the whole of the Kalahari herding their cattle back then, when we still had about 200,000 lions in Africa, and you hear their stories, some of them thinking there was millions of wildebeest walking around here, it makes you wonder, is that even possible? But if we're looking at the capacity that we spoke about earlier, it is actually possible that the Kalahari could have been host to that amount of animals if we're considering that people back then did not have a big impact and didn't use much of the space for other activities. If we look at the situation today, we have a few tens of thousands of wildebeest left in the country. And between our other wildlife, it's also dropped very, very drastically. And although we unfortunately don't have numbers from these huge amounts, there are some scientifically recorded numbers that I would just like to, to go through real quickly. So in 1978, wildebeest were recorded at over 315,000. In 1999, basically just 20 years later, 46,000. Red hartebeest numbers in 1978, 293,462. In 99, 31,114. Springboks have dropped from over 100,000 to 51,000 in the same time. Zebras from 100,000 to 50,000. Now, if we exclude springbok here, because now let's look back at our lion population for a moment. And remember what we said in the beginning, I would like to explain why our lions have disappeared. And at this point, it's probably becoming clear to most people. If we're simply looking at animals that are potentially lion prey, like wildebeest, red hartebeest, and zebra, we have around 700,000 animals there for lions. In 1978, we have around 183,000, about 25% of that only, left in 1999. So we can assume fairly safely that within that region of the Kalahari, which is massive, we're talking about the size of several countries in Europe, we lost roughly 75% of the food for our lions, which means we would have lost roughly 75% of the lion population sitting in that area. At the same time, we need to remember that cattle started being raised all over the place, that those hungry lions who didn't find enough food anymore would most likely then end up in farms. And here we are looking at the human predator conflict that is so often mentioned, but often misunderstood. Now, those lions don't exactly have anywhere else to go. Now, the cattle are being raised for other purposes, and we'll get back into that in just a moment. But we don't want the lion eating all the cattle. Whoever is raising those cattle otherwise doesn't have a livelihood, their family wouldn't live, and so on. So the lions get shot. And yes, we could go save that lion from being shot, but that does not mean it makes sense to put him back into the Kalahari. And we're only looking at a 20-year time period. Now, let's quickly look a little bit of why did that happen, because, you know, it, it's a very drastic decline over a short amount of time. And if we're thinking about the stories from another 20 years before that, when there was maybe many times that amount of animals still migrating through these areas, it makes us wonder what, what actually happened. What happened was quite simple. Before Botswana gained independence from Britain, Botswana used to be a British protectorate. In 1952, when it was still under the British rule, Botswana or then Bechuana land, built fences, pretty much one fence, several hundred kilometers in the more northern section of the country, right on the top of what's today called Central Kalahari Game Reserve. It's called the Kuki Fence. The fence was started to be built back then, obviously, through the British Empire. And that fence was designed to stop wildebeest from moving into areas where people are starting to farm cattle. Now, the reason for that is mainly not to spread diseases, but also because these massive herds of animals eat a lot of vegetation, and that's not exactly welcome if you're trying to have your cattle graze on the natural vegetation that grows here. But a big issue is the foot and mouth disease, which most people would have heard of, and especially buffalo you usually carry stuff like foot and mouth disease, and wildebeest that are migrating like that would utilize areas with buffalo together, and then move from those areas through areas where there are cattle and they could potentially spread those diseases. So those fences were starting to be put up. Now they were simply being put in the way of this migration. And that started back then. The first big die-offs of wildebeest herds were reported in 1964 and 1970 at a place called Lake Kao, which is one of the sort of 
you know, most southern areas that the Okavango floodwaters can reach. Now, that is an area that animals needed to reach in dry years when large seasonal pans in the Kalahari completely dried up and there was no other source of water available for them. Now, those years would mean that quite a number of those animals would die, that hyenas and vultures are thriving in those times, actually, and other predators because there's lots of easy prey around. But eventually, that a lot of these numbers and the strongest and fittest and so on would reach water. They survive those dry months. And as the rains get better, those populations move back and now they're healthy and they start breeding and they're doing well and they reach the numbers that they used to be. Unfortunately, when these animals started arriving on these areas, not only were fences put in the way which simply stopped them from getting to the water, also the competition was becoming much, much larger because people started moving in everywhere where there is fresh water. It's hard to find fresh water in a desert and wherever it is up on the surface, people used to be there trying to farm livestock. That livestock eats vegetation. All of a sudden the animals come there even though there is water to drink. It's hard to survive because the competition for vegetation is big. But the main reason really was that fences were put up to stop these animals from reaching their destination and hundreds of thousands of animals must have died. Maybe even millions, we don't know. Now, these were just reports in um, some diaries and records that settlers had taken back then. But what happened then with the numbers we've just been looking at between 1978 and 99 is that in the early 80s, there were more severe drought years and in those years again these animals that needed the water needed to get to that water so badly started moving north and now there's a fence in the way and they could not get through and that is pretty much where we had that next massive drop and this one is one that was fairly well recorded and we know that that was 75 percent of our larger herbivores that simply disappeared along these fence lines and it happened in a 20-year time period but likely most of that happened within a few years of drought where we did not have enough rain to sustain any permanent water in the southern parts of the Kalahari ecosystem. I think it's obvious to most people that through the following years up till today, nothing really has gotten much better. We definitely haven't fixed the situation. Humans have encroached more and more into spaces where wild animals previously lived. And we have lost more of our animals. We do not have 46,000 wildebeest left. I actually don't know the real number today. But nothing's really changed and they haven't bounced back or anything like that. And it is obvious now that our lion population has declined. I think it's also very obvious to assume that we have potentially lost more than 90% of these wild herbivores. Which also means there may have been actually more lions than we assume we're sort of assuming about 20,000 left in Africa today from about 200,000 60 70 years back and I believe those numbers could could be very wrong because we didn't have that great record keeping back then of any number of species and what we should maybe consider is that today Botswana has around 3 million cattle that they're farming in in this country and another 3 million between the goats, donkeys, and, and sheep and stuff like that. So 6 million livestock that are being farmed in this country. And we are not even using close to the space that's actually available as in vegetation. Now, obviously, we can only farm that livestock where we either have permanent surface water or where we can drill a hole into the ground and we can access fresh groundwater. Many areas of the Kalahari do not have fresh groundwater which means that's places where people have not farmed yet. And also those are places, many of them, that are now designated wildlife areas. They are huge. Central Kalahari Game Reserve alone is larger than Denmark, for example. The Kalahari Transfrontier Park is close to the size of Central Kalahari Game Reserve. And all of these parks here have what's called wildlife management areas that is actually surrounding them. So there's even more space that is not called National Park or Game Reserve, but is also designated wildlife areas. And in a way that's very lucky and that's beautiful, but although all this vegetation continues to grow in these areas, there is no access for sweet, for good fresh water for the animal populations here, which means the ones that need to migrate, like the wildebeest and the zebras, the zebras never migrated as far south, I imagine, as the wildebeest would do. And I also don't believe that their numbers would have ever been that high. The absolute main number really is wildebeest that make this massive migration. Now they have a very high intensity lifestyle. They need to run 
and move thousands of kilometers through a season to sustain this because they can't stay in one place. They're going to eat everything and then there's nothing left. They're always on the move. And that is what creates this fa fascinating migration. And it it is a way of this ecosystem giving it a lot of utilization for a moment where a lot of the vegetation gets eaten, but then it's being left alone. And next year, they might not even come through the same area. So that area is time to recover because maybe another area simply had a bit more you know, more water available or more rain, so the vegetation is better there. And that's how all of this worked with that amazing miracle of this Okavango Delta flooding when everything else is starting to get dry. The situation we're left with today are facts. There's nothing we can negotiate about, and it's very unfortunate. But the question now remains, what can we do about it? Looking at the facts basically says we have deleted 90% of our wild animal populations, and... Something that should be kept in mind is that Botswana does not need to farm all the livestock that they are farming today. This was set up before Botswana got independence in 1966. And throughout the following years, the European Union continued business with Botswana and it subsidized the beef industry in Botswana. It obviously helped create these fences. It actually stipulated that the fences had to be put up in order to create what we call today green zones so that the beef that is actually farmed here in the Kalahari can be exported to Europe. And there's a lot behind this, this story that we need to understand. And I think mostly it is that there is a huge demand for resource, for protein in any way that that will be made in the end. Personally, while I lived in Germany, I never saw a, a steak from Botswana on my plate. So I haven't actually gotten much proof of that anywhere on the internet, but I do believe a lot of the beef exported has to be made into all kinds of products, some of it potentially pet food. And if we're looking at that, those kind of numbers, you know, just dogs in Germany, I think I looked it up once, are more than 10 million pets that we keep there. I used to have lots of pets and I love my dogs. I have nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. But what we need to understand is that those dogs will eat food and 10 million dogs probably could feed a few million lions. I don't mean feeding the dogs to the lions, but I mean the food that those dogs are consuming, you know, could easily feed a couple of million lions. Now the whole continent of Africa only has maybe 20,000 lions left, while one country in Germany can create enough food to feed maybe 10 million dogs. That's just things, you know, we need to start looking at them and realizing it's just a fact. It, it, I, I really wish it would be different, but that's not sharing very fairly. And if we think that the countries we live in can, can sustainably grow everything that we're utilizing and that we do on this earth, I think we're, we're dreaming. And that is why we are in business with places like Botswana, where Europe imports a lot of beef. And don't get me wrong, the beef market has been the second largest income for Botswana after diamonds for a very long time. Recently, in the past years, tourism has taken over the second place, but beef is still a big, big market and it's paying the livelihood for many people. And all they're trying to do here is to get to a similar standard than what we are already used to. And I don't think anyone can blame them for this. So if we want to help the scenario, we need to find a way where the people can benefit from keeping their areas wild just as much as they do from having their cattle around here. Otherwise, we're not really getting anywhere. And this is where it becomes so important that the communities here in Africa are the ones wanting the change for conservation, whatever change that may be, because otherwise we can throw money at this and continue to try and have our ideas, but it's not going to make a difference because it's the people that live here at the end of the day. And personally, I need to say, who are we to blame them? We come from countries where most of our nature has disappeared because we've occupied every single last bit of it. And we are actually now importing our goods from areas like this. And I was never aware of that ever in my life. And I don't want to get too much more into numbers and details, but please feel free to Google the European beef industry and Botswana, and you're going to find plenty of articles describing the business relationship and articles about this whole story. Yeah, I think after hearing these facts and looking at this past, it's definitely not surprising that we have lost 90% of Africa's lion populations in this time span that we've been talking about. 
And I think on top of everything, we still need to remember Botswana today is still regarded one of Africa's absolute hotspots for wildlife. And what I'm trying to say by that is we should maybe not even try to imagine what happened in most other countries in Africa or worldwide to our wildlife populations. And, you know, aside from the fences and everything else, there are many other factors like roads, which sort of form a natural boundary for animals, not just because there's noise, uh, unknown terrain and all kinds of stuff, but also because roads mean access. If you put a tar road into a certain area, it means people can get there a hell of a lot easier than they ever have before in history, which also means they're going to settle down anywhere near the road because there's easy access now and they can use a little bit of land farm cattle or goats or sheep and they have access to a truck that comes past they can pick up the animals they have buses that go to town regularly so at the sides of our tar roads we have a growing farming community people that settle down which basically makes any tar road a very wide barrier that that starts existing for wildlife and all kinds of factors poaching and so on becomes an issue in these areas which similar to a fence cuts these areas into pieces and that is not good our wildebeest have disappeared in these huge numbers because access to permanent surface water was taken away from them a lot of the kalahari species also have a migration but that migration is very different species for example like chemsbok or springbok they do not depend on permanent surface water, but they depend on water in a certain way. Now the Kalahari may have regions where in one area it rained almost nothing. It just stays dry. There's not much there. There's a little bit of green there throughout the rainy season, but it just dries up as soon as the rain stops. And other areas, maybe a few hundred kilometers away, got massive amounts of rain because a few big thunderstorms just happened here. Now many plants in the ground in those areas will form beautiful tubers and the plants itself are nice and green the leaves are green and juicy and those are areas where these desert species will spend most of the dry season now if they're not able to move these big distances within these desert areas then in a similar way like the wildebeest couldn't get to the fresh water at the lakes or the rivers those animals will start dying because they now have have trouble accessing these places and at the same time, we need to remember wherever people start settling down, they will pick a place where they can somehow access water easy, where the, the area has something special, like fresh ground water that usually means some rocky bits, there's minerals in the rocks and so on. And that gets occupied by livestock, which means there's no more space for wildlife. Wildlife is slowly losing all the little important niches and the ability to move these large distances. And that effect combined causes the decline in our Kalahari species, although as a total mass, even in the past when they could walk wherever they were, they would have never made up the numbers that the wildebeest would do with the actual huge migration that they managed. But at the moment, we're seeing big declines in springbok over the last years and potentially also other desert species, and that has to do with their movement and certain areas that they used to utilize simply being very restricted for them. And things like tar roads and stuff like that play a big role in that area. Coming back to the beginning of this whole thing and my dream of going to Africa and catching all the lions and having them somewhere, caring for them, making them nice and healthy, and then letting them go again. I think we can all agree by now that we don't really have anywhere to let them go. We have a lot of space left in the Kalahari, but I'm going to basically damn that lion to either die from starvation but it's much more likely that that lion's going to die because some lions will occupy that territory and maybe we made that lion big enough and strong enough and he's actually going to beat up a lion in that area kill another lion and he takes over that area but we still haven't now created another lion all we created is a problem in a natural ecosystem where for what's left today we have lion populations that are according to the size of prey available to them at the right number. There are a few other animals where I have to just say quickly, there are things where maybe programs to actually breed make a bit of sense. The African wild dog, for example, is so enormously endangered today that the few little pockets of populations that are left in Southern Africa may be not enough to sustain a genetically healthy population. So captive breeding projects can actually keep the species alive and it's sad that that has to happen. But in this case, if the future idea is that the species is just genetically healthy 
and later on when things get better that we can then release them back into the wild then obviously this is a sensible thing to do but that still bears in mind that there has to be some sort of effort to make the other things better otherwise all we do is breed wild dogs in enclosures that are never going to go anywhere and in all honesty i know wild animals very well i i spend a lot of very close time with with Serga, obviously and it's just not a life for them to to just spend time inside a cage they need to be wild and that is why they exist so we can save a species by doing things like that and if we focus on certain ones like wild dogs where we may only have a few thousand of them left in the whole of africa lions we have actually relatively healthy populations left in for example the kalahari in botswana and we don't really have to introduce other genes here to keep them healthy but we need to somehow try and find out how can we fix this whole problem with their food disappearing yeah i think the question is first of all why should we do this why should we help wildlife it might sound like a stupid question but i think the emotional argument here is fairly obvious we love lions we just want them to be free we love wildlife in africa we want to come on a safari and look at all of this and take our photographs and it's just so beautiful and we don't want to live in the world without them and i do not want to live in the world without lions i do not want to live in the world without many things and mostly i'm talking about nature i also do not want to live in a world without the technology we have today and i do believe there are ways of achieving the right thing but not everybody just loves animals and we have to find other arguments specifically to convince the people who are not willing to already do something about our nature and about their lifestyle essentially which is why we are losing nature but there are very very valid arguments for our wildlife and i just want to quickly sort of get into that subject because it's important that we can explain to somebody else why we need this. Now, what an ecosystem actually does, pretty much no matter where that is, is that it takes carbon and it stores it. So the carbon dioxide that humans are releasing can be absorbed specifically by woody vegetation and somehow be stored back into our earth. And that is some part of a natural cycle that's happening now human activity on this planet has increased this natural cycle drastically while we are decreasing all the areas that can potentially store this harmful toxic waste that we are emitting the whole time so that's creating a very bad exponentially growing problem which we are sitting in today and that's where the whole climate change thing starts now that's a hell of a lot more complicated than that but it's just to give the basic idea now this ecosystem like the kalahari and what it used to be it works perfectly well like this and it is such a, a stunning you know feature with the okavango delta and all of these things and these animals roaming around now what happens when we take them away we might see a huge increase and fires in the Kalahari because of what we spoke about earlier. Now, fires here are very natural for our ecosystem, but if nothing is eating our grass, if we take all of these migratory animals out of here, those wildebeest herds that come and literally cutting fire breaks throughout the Kalahari during the rainy season and leaving behind little bits to burn, where actually a healthy fire might come through, clear a bit of the small shrubs and give beautiful open area space for grazing to grow again the next year, all of a sudden we're standing with grass as tall as me growing everywhere and then falling down dying and then a fire coming and that fire will have a hell of a different intensity it will be very hot and instead of just burning a bit on the ground and taking away a bit of the shrub and stuff that lies around there it might start burning down our trees a lot of our woody vegetation which is actually storing carbon but now instead of storing it by getting burned it's releasing it back into our atmosphere and that might be a problem now that means the natural ecosystem that we are destroying becomes a problem that we are creating and it's doing the same thing that a, a city is doing full of humans not in the same way but i think people get the point now this scientifically has to be proven there are people looking at this for quite some time trying to get the actual numbers what is really being stored what's happening but this is just an example of how an ecosystem is supposed to benefit and what we need to understand is that it only does that if we keep a certain balance 
Now, if we are trying to say, okay, no problem, if this is the issue, then let's just send a bunch of tractors in there and we're just going to start cutting down the grasses, we're going to bale it, we're going to use it for some cattle and for this and that, and then the Kalahari won't burn like that and we can keep a healthy ecosystem. You know what? It'll look beautiful. You can make it look like a golf course, the entire area. I've actually seen a few areas where people are, uh, you know, haying, baling grass for the dry season, and it looks stunning. Very clean areas, nice little trees in between. It's not going to burn hot so that those trees would be in danger. The problem is the emissions we're creating by going in there and cutting this are definitely way worse than, or much more than that few trees there would ever store or save for us. So we do not have the ability yet as people ever to go into this and replace nature in any way. Now, what these things are giving back magically is oxygen that we breathe and specifically people not being interested in wildlife and just loving their city life and all kinds of stuff. There's nothing wrong with that. But specifically then, people should care very much that there are areas where the air that they actually breathe comes from. Because otherwise, we're going to look at a very, very bad scenario for our children, grandchildren, humanity overall. And that is really what conservationists are trying to, to do. They're not trying to say, oh, we need to protect this one line as a species just because they need to be here. There are entire ecosystems that are important to all of us and to everybody, to all life, the way we know it on this planet. And personally, I just choose to be part of at least an attempt of doing something for that instead of being part of an entire civilization who is simply running everything into the ground without a care in the world. And a lot of the intention behind what I do comes from a love for these wild animals and a love for nature. But it's important that everybody understands, even if you don't have that love for the outdoors and wildlife at all, the importance is still the same and everybody needs to care. I think it's time for me to start talking a little bit about what I actually would like to do with my project and the stuff that not just me, but the whole team here with the Modisa Wildlife Project is actually trying to achieve. And it seems pretty obvious from everything we've spoken about now that breeding lions to release them or even catching them to release them may not be an idea that has any real effect on our wild lion population at all. Rather, maybe create the opposite effect, create trouble in functioning ecosystems, although they have much less animals than what we would like them to have. But the big thing that becomes very, very clear out of this whole story is that water is one of the big issues. And if we're looking at the scenario today, even if we can drill a, a borehole, a perfect borehole, it's actually not that great to provide water just in one spot. And it's very expensive to put long pipes underground and pump that water. Also, it is questionable whether it is a good idea to pump empty our groundwater table because I don't believe that humans yet understand exactly what that actually does for us and for us, us on the surface and maybe for our wildlife or our vegetation. So what I believe is that we can catch water from rain. And this is actually something that was brought to me by a guest at our camp who actually has a PhD in this environmental science stuff. And he has done much of his theses about rainwater and that catchment. And he brought that to my mind. And that's something else I never thought of. Actually, a fairly small area of any sort of catchment system could just be tin roofs, even the top, and then a tank storage area for that water. A small, small area, a few hectares, can catch massive amounts of water that can feed thousands of wild animals throughout a dry season. And there will be podcast episodes coming up with very specific subjects about these things, you know, like the fires and the Kalahari and how the predator actually affects the grasses and things like that. And also definitely one about this rainwater catchment idea. But the bottom line to make it very simple is if one would go and put out hundreds of rainwater catchment systems throughout these massive areas, through areas where we want our animals to migrate, through areas where there are no people right now, where they can move around. And we put enough of these systems out there. Each system would obviously catch according to whatever rainfall you get in that area, more or less water. And we would be able to provide water with a sort of artificially influenced migration of animals along these routes where the water catchment systems are put up. And 
simultaneously, we would only provide a lot of water in an area where it has rained a lot. And naturally, that would be the spot where many, many animals would focus on through the dry months. So I believe that that kind of system could recreate the most natural impact on the vegetation, on that so important baseline of our food pyramid and of our ecosystem, so that we could really create an, an amazing scenario where not millions, but potentially hundreds of thousands of animals in a few decades time again could migrate through the Kalahari areas. And wildebeest do exceptionally well if they have access to water. Every private reserve that is set up on much smaller spaces, like the one that we're actually sitting on and that we're managing here, every area like that, if, if it has wildebeest, the wildebeest breed too much, they become a big problem. They have to be taken out on a very regular basis because they're just too many. Now, many people don't like to eat wildebeest here. There's no market for the meat or any such thing. So often people just want to get rid of them. There are so many private areas here where these animals could be taken, then relocated into the parks once fresh water is available. But it just doesn't make that much sense before water is available. We're just condemning these animals to die. And then honestly, it's better just to shoot them in the farms where at least they have a quick death rather than slowly starving somewhere in the parks. And the only thing we might create is to increase the lion population very temporarily because we dump a lot of food for them in one place. They might make babies. They think they're happy, but the food will disappear again because it can't breed, it can't reproduce. And in a few months time, there's less food, more lions. The lions will walk into the farm. So we increase the human wildlife conflict, more lions being shot or poisoned and potentially people killed. So it just creates problems that we don't want. So it's important. First, the water and then we would see a natural increase in the herbivore populations that are still existing today. And there are some very tough, isolated wildebeest herds who are still running around, but it's extremely few. And those could start breeding up, but we could help that breeding up process by reintroducing more of them to make it faster. And we could simply monitor our lion population because lions can breed extremely well. And as the density of prey increases, the lion density should increase and therefore their territory size should decrease. So they would create smaller homes because they won't have to move so much. There's more food available and that way more prides of lions or bigger prides of lions for the similar amount of space that they're using right now could exist again. And although this all sounds amazing, it's a very, very big thing and it would take many millions of dollars and luckily, I still have hopefully quite many years left in my life to work on this dream. But nevertheless, we are sitting on a private reserve where I know we can achieve this dream that we are you know, going to be able to build one of these rainwater catchment systems here to prove that we can run our seven and a half thousand hectares of wild area with all the animals in it just off that rainwater. And that can be used as a sample that could be put on a larger scale into these big areas and also once we've set up one system we know the you know bits and pieces that don't work what needs to be improved we know the pricing very well and we can really start going at how can this be implemented and that would require major studies many people and organizations involved and most of all obviously the Botswana government and the people here in Botswana who need to support this idea so we're a long way away from that, but that is the big dream. If it all works out, maybe when I'm really old and sort of retired, I can sit somewhere here in the Kalahari and watch a few hundred thousand animals migrate again. But I'm very well aware of the fact that that's an extremely unlikely um, scenario since if we look at the last 60, 70 years, pretty much the opposite's happened and we only have a tiny percentage left of what used to be there. And although it's theoretically possible, practice is a very different thing. And I would be very happy to just live here, continue our seven and a half thousand hectares of a beautiful place with wild animals and do the best just for that little area. But I think if I wouldn't dream big, I would have never even made it to Africa. So there's got to be some goal and we're not going to stop trying and see where it gets us. Now, as amazing as all this sounds, even if that works, even if we bring back a few hundred thousand wildebeest in the Kalahari, there's another issue, and I think it's actually relatively clear if we think about what's being said here about animals that we can't have too many for an area and so on. And people are just another animal. And unfortunately, we are a relatively large population 
and that's actually putting it into very careful terms we are heavily overpopulating this earth with our species no matter how we want to utilize the earth we're just too many and the problem is we live in a capitalistic system in a economy where growth is needed where we need to con continuously grow our population and we live in a finite environment we have one big globe that is there for us and we are depleting every bit of resource that is left on that area and there is no way to even use the word sustainability if we don't understand that a constant growth in our population cannot be sustainable because it means we are more every year if we think that for the future we cannot exist and maybe that's why certain companies are out there looking for places to live on mars and stuff like that but there are actually very valid reasons or why even if that works why that doesn't make much sense and i mean that working is fairly unlikely now i really want to make clear i am not somebody who says we should just go and and kill the human population i i admire the human population i love technology i think it's amazing that we have airplanes i fly myself and i love it technology the fact that i'm sitting in the middle of the bush right now in one of the rem most remote corners of our planet talking into a little microphone standing on my desk and sending that stuff out into the whole world so people can listen, being connected through a satellite internet connection. What people have created is absolutely outstanding, and we have created a wealth of knowledge. But the problem is not that we need to you know, not breed or start killing each other. The, the reality is we need to understand the problem, and to understand the problem, it will boil down to the fact our system doesn't really work for this idea it has worked for quite some time but it's not sustainable and it will require huge change and maybe what's happening at the moment with the current corona pandemic that is part of nature making some changes for us that are simply necessary in the meantime i believe it's important that we keep these wild animal species around that potential is there for the for these ecosystems to function again and that is what I would like to try and do with my life. Now, there's a lot more to understand about the whole globe and the system and this stuff I've just sort of quickly mentioned. And I really just want to advertise something here. And it's from a late professor called Albert Bartlett. And if I'm not mistaken right now, he was teaching at the Boulder University in Colorado. And he did a lecture I think over a thousand times I've read it on Wikipedia quite some time back. And that lecture was actually shown to me by the same guy who told me about the rainwater catchment idea, which I always thought would not work at all in the desert, but turns out it could work extremely well just by somebody who knows what they're talking about telling you. And in the same way, this guy, this professor has spent much of his lifetime with this specific issue of sustainability and he does an amazing lecture on the human population in relation to energy and consumption and what we're living today. Now, his lecture is actually from quite some years back and it is absolutely accurate today. And there's going to be a link to the lecture on YouTube underneath here in the podcast description so that people can look at it. I would also like to just put a few links there to a couple of articles about the wildebeest die-offs in the Kalahari and things like that, scientific references so people can actually, if you're more interested, you know, get into this a little bit deeper and also see that I'm not just sitting here telling you lies that I make up, but this is actually just facts that have been recorded. And unfortunately, they exist. I wish it wouldn't be the case. I hope that this episode did yeah, something to everybody who's been listening i would really appreciate comments about your thoughts on the whole story and what it means to you and if this all makes sense i'm also happy to answer questions and maybe you know include questions and things that are maybe not being understood that i didn't explain well in future episodes but like i said a lot of more detailed information about how the actual ecosystem here works very much on the ground what exactly is a predator's role or specifically a lion's role in this ecosystem and what do fires do why can they be good and why can they be bad why can they be called a hot fire and a cold fire things like that are going to come in future episodes other episodes are going to be in between just about our life just to have a little bit of entertainment at the same time and i think that's it for today thanks very much for listening and hope to well, see you next time 
when we're doing our next episode. We're going to do a Corona special. Southern Africa, for the ones of you that don't know, has actually had or has currently some of the strictest lockdowns in the world. And we are oddly impacted by this whole story because we're sitting in the middle of nowhere. We have a lot of space around us. But many things actually do become quite challenging because of what's been going on. And I think it's just the right time to to do a little episode about that, just a quick one. So that's going to follow after this one's been published. And thanks again for being here. And I hope you enjoyed the episode. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Kalahari Diaries. Did you enjoy the podcast? Fantastic. You can help me tremendously by subscribing and rating it on your podcast app. Leave a review and tell friends and family about it if you feel like it. If you want to know more about the story, go ahead and check out the website on sergeythelioness.com or follow me on social media. You'll find me on Instagram and Facebook at Val Grüner, that is at V-A-L-G-R-U-E-N-E-R, and at Modisa Wildlife Project, where I'm sharing photos and videos from the Kalahari on a regular basis. I'm Val, and you've been listening to the Kalahari Diaries.